The chair on the stage represents those artists around the world who have been robbed of their right to freedom of expression, who are prevented from practicing their craft openly or without fear of persecution, and who are unable to join us today. It is a reminder that the silencing of writers in one country robs the entire world of their voices. This particular chair is dedicated to one of the more than 900 writers who last year were either killed, on trial, or in hiding because of their work. We have a writer who has been incarcerated for 32 years in Florida, and he has participated actively in our contests for many years, and uh, he also participated in a, a, a collaboration we do with the Anne Frank USA Center, and they have a diary project. And for some of the things that he wrote in his daily diary, he was recently um, put into solitary confinement and without explanation, without cause. And I, I understand he's now back into the normal prison population, but uh, retaliations for the written word are still a very real real problem and that's something we'll probably talk a little bit about today all right so our panelists today are uh, piper kerwin and uh, also adrian nicole leblanc and tony cardinalis and i've asked um, them to each say a little bit something about why they're here today hi i'm piper kerman and i've just published a a personal narrative, a memoir, about the 13 months that I spent in federal prison. I was released in 2005, and I spent that year in prison for a drug crime that I committed in 1994. So there was a big gap. Um, so that was over like 10 years before? It was a little over 10 years in between the commission of the offense and, and me walking into prison. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, my name is Adrian, and I'm a journalist. And uh, for a, a large part of the front end of my writing career, uh, and remain interested in the subject, I'm, I covered poverty. And there's, I think, probably no way that you can cover that subject and not at some point end up in a correctional facility, certainly in this country. And my uh, uh, pieces of work in that subject led to a project, Random Family. Um, Anthony, who's not here yet, but he's on his way, is one of the young people that I met in the course of writing that book who spent uh, 17 years uh, incarcerated. And I met him right before he went in, and he was recently released. And um, he was one of the prime subjects of that, that book. Great. I thought we would start by, um, you know, I, I, I talked to uh, Piper on the telephone the other night, and you told me a story about when you were uh, in facilities, what was available for materials to work with as a writer. And I thought that would be a good place to begin. Can you tell us about that? Uh, that's interesting. Um, so during the, during the 13 months that I was incarcerated, I spent 11 months of that in a low security prison camp in Connecticut uh, that was adjacent to a high security women's facility. And then I spent, um, many weeks in the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City, uh, which is sort of like FedEx for prisoners mm. within the federal system. It's the closest thing to limbo that I think exists on this planet. <laughs> um, and then some time in the federal jail in Chicago. So those three facilities were all very different, um, high security, low security, and incredibly different in terms of the conditions of incarceration. And in the minimum security camp where I started my time, and in truth, in just about any facility, I, uh, any of the three facilities I, I spent time in, um, there's no significant provision of anything by the prison, even down to toothpaste. You have to buy your own toothpaste, and you have to buy your own pens and your own paper, um, and your own stamps and your own envelopes, and so on and so forth. And that's fine, but the day you show up in prison, you have none of those things and you have no way of obtaining them other than from another prisoner. And the first day I spent in prison, one of the things that was most shocking to me, terrified, very afraid of violence because that's the way that prisons and prisoners are always depicted, was that women began to approach me. I was, you, you find yourself wearing a significantly different uniform than all the other prisoners, so it's incredibly obvious that you're new. 
and they would say things like, do you need some shampoo? Do you need a cup of coffee? I can make you some instant coffee. Do you need a piece of paper to write your family? You know, it's okay, Kerman, this is a really bad day, but it's gonna get better. This sort of informal welcome wagon of folks sort of saying, well, you're here now and we have some of the things you need, so let's hook you up so that you're not floundering around. So those pens and paper were literally like, a pen was the first thing I owned. You know, even you know, right down to the underpants you're wearing, those belong to the government. But another prisoner gave me a pen, a piece of paper, a stamp, and an envelope to write my family. And that was, you know, that's both devastating and also um, incredibly important. And I was really obsessed with that pen for a couple of weeks. Um, in Oklahoma City, you know, it was this sort of very strange, high security, limbo-like facility. And so we had these tiny little stubs and little scraps of paper and you could sort of cobble together a letter um, that way. And I, I, my, my husband kept all the letters that I wrote to him, my then fiance, now husband. And you know, it's this tiny little piece of paper with, with chicken scratch with that pen. Um, so the, the literal conditions which, in, with which you can write are um, constrained and really important. And I think for me, a middle class person who you know, had a lengthy professional career, there was something really interesting about the departure from computers and keyboards to handwriting everything. Um, and I was very fortunate because I had many people writing to me, my friends, my family, even strangers. Um, would write to me while I was there, and writing back diligently became just this incredibly important thing. So the correspondence aspect, in addition to the documentation of what you're feeling, what you're observing, what you're going through, is I think just so important. You know, we get a lot of uh, manuscripts. One of the things that our program does is we, we sponsor an annual writing contest, and somebody told me this very early on, that you can tell how much uh, paper or or, or uh, you know, writing implements are available by the size of the handwriting. And if it's a facility where paper is really hard to come by, the handwriting will be really, really tiny. I don't know if that's true, but you certainly do see some very tiny handwriting. Um, you visited, um, Adrian, uh, uh, you know, the facilities with the families when they were visiting. Can you talk a little bit about what you saw in terms of what was available or what you know to be available and what Anthony maybe has told you? Sure. Um, I could, I, one thing that you just made me think about with regard to the writing uh, and the keeping in touch with your family, one thing that I saw again and again, um, I was very lucky as a journalist that there was that written correspondence between a lot of people because I was able to use some of that um, material in, as a way to understand experiences that I couldn't get access to, but also because, as some of you may know, in order to call your family from within a correctional facility, you have to call collect, and those collect calls are extremely, extremely expensive, and many families can't actually afford to accept those phone calls, so letters become all the more important. And um, so I was just thinking about that with regard to the phone calls. But um, it's interesting, I, um, my first issue with regard to the writing in prison was really a selfish one, which was how can I report on what I'm trying to see from coming in from the outside. So the basic task I had was how do I um, actually document the limited access that I get. So in visiting rooms, there are, I mean, the, the utensils sort of that you could get your hands on if people were playing games and they had pens or pe you know pencils and paper to keep score. Um, the children's section of the visiting room would sometimes have crayons and paper for kids and I would pretend that I was you know, coloring or that I was drawing and I would be taking notes on those with a crayon or uh, with a score. And Anthony was a um, lucky for me, he, he was a quite a letter writer and um, was willing to tolerate lots of basic questions. But in his case, um, we never actually talked about his access to the materials. Um, it was more that when he, and he'll talk about this, I'm sure, he 
began to uh, receive an education while he was incarcerated. He had the rare, extremely rare good fortune, and I mean extremely rare good fortune that there was a really good program in one of the facilities he was in. And as he began to study, that's when the conversations around uh, writing occurred, but the supplies weren't an issue, so I can't really speak very intelligently. I, I can say that photographs were certainly as important as actual written texts. They were extremely important. Um, family sending photographs out, you know, uh, people getting photographs taken in prison and sending them out, or people trying to send them in to see their families, especially the women who are in prison, because the prisons for women are so far flung that many of them are very, very far from their families, and they, they have absolutely no chance of a visit. So mm -hmm. words are certainly important, but I found that um, images were as well. Yeah, and the only thing I'll add about w incarcerated women is that about, I think the stat is around 80% of them are mothers, and a huge percentage of those mothers have primary custody of their children. So their incarceration, whatever its cause, whatever its reason, is devastating, obviously to them, but to many more people, and it's absolutely true. I mean, when I was sent to prison, there were 11 women's federal facilities in the entire country. So if I had not been put in Danbury, Connecticut, and had instead been put in, let's say, West Virginia, that the, I mean, I don't have children, um, but you know, the prospect of visits you know, just drops off the cliff. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Adrian, you talked about um, letters that you saw and used in the book, and there's this incredible documentation that you feel underneath that text. And I remember there's one, even it, it, there's a, a one of the characters is going, looking for her members of her family, and she's in an apartment, and you even have like, there's a Mother's Day card on the floor, and that detail is so perfectly placed. What did you feel your responsibilities were, or your duties as a journalist were, to portray this accurately? What liberties did you feel you could take, you know, to condense it for a book? Did you move details around, or were they always accurate to the scene you were depicting? Yeah, well, the scene, the, if the details were in the scene, if I were saying the Mother's Day card was, you know, on the floor, it was in that space at, at that moment. Um, but the issues of, the related issues to that, the issues that relate to that question with regard to prison are very um, particular. Here's Anthony. Oh, great. Hey. <laughs> Coming up. Hello. Did you, did you uh, get the name of the guy who took your car? <laughs> or the woman who took your car? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. We've kind of introduced you so the audience has some sense of, and we, they know you were stuck in traffic, so relax, everything's good. And um, Adrian is answering a question about details um, that she used in, in the book. Well, I think um, one, well, two things were um, I found as a journalist that you, often you are looking for when you're in, uh, talking to people is, you know, some people are completely uninterested in the kinds of questions that I need to ask and they get very impatient with the kind of detail that I need so um, for example if I were trying to I mean Anthony so I don't know you never expressed frustration you may have had it but you never expressed it but I would often ask things like what does your cell look like you know I mean literally what's on the wall what's it made out of I mean I was I needed uh, detailed information about what I couldn't see because my access was completely limited. I could maybe get a tour at a prison at, um, to see what a cell looked like, but I could never see any space that he was in. It was all really dependent upon his willingness to describe things to me. And then the other thing that was um, really important was that he also uh, had the ability to describe those things vividly. I mean, some of us do and some of us don't. You know, some people are great storytellers, some people aren't. They describe things in colors, textures, whatever, and he did. I mean, he had sort of um, just a natural gift for detail. And um, so there was a lot of that going on, but the, the complicated thing that outside of the challenge that a lack of access from the outside in uh, creates is the risk of what the person who's helping you is uh, put at because they're in the facility. So I'm visiting him, we're on the phone, I'm asking certain questions. I, and this may be, Piper, you can also answer. My concern ethically um, was as probably more what risk does it put people in that I'm an, a journalist 
spending a lot of time with them and they're, t you know, if something were to come out in some way that can't be anticipated that would put them in some kind of compromised situation with the authorities, that was what really concerned me. So, um, and I was new to a lot of it, so I, I think I didn't really know what the consequences could or couldn't be. And that was, I worried about that in spades when the book actually came out. Because even though the names were changed, some of the names were changed, there was no doubt that anybody that read the book knew that they Anthony, could track down. Anthony, were you down. nervous? Were you nervous about those details when you were talking to Adrian about them? Conscious of them. Um, so, can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was conscious of them and I always try to answer in a way that safeguarded against being penalized against it. The trouble with that is that we really don't know or anticipate what we would get in trouble for okay. at times. Yeah. So, but I was comfortable as, um, answering many of her questions because they were not really compromising to the security of the facility. And I was aware of what I can and cannot say. Like the only hiccup would come is, was when they would, questions would arise where I would be unsure of what would get me in trouble or what wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But overall, I think I was, um, she was clear about what she was intending to do, and I think that that message was clear in the dialogue. So no matter who heard our exchange, they would know that it wasn't malicious. Did, did you yourself do any writing about uh, during that period of time about your own personal feelings or, or circumstances at that moment? Or Every last letter that I wrote to that, every person that I communicated with was a reflection of what I was feeling sometimes layered with defense mechanisms just so I wouldn't expose myself because I felt like I had to protect myself against being hurt. And so there was, but every letter that I ever wrote was a reflection of what I was feeling at the moment. Did you ever feel like you had to censor yourself or what you really thought or felt, or did you feel like it was okay? It was, um, not a conscious censure. Like I didn't do it, like say, okay, I'm gonna censor what I'm gonna say because I don't wanna expose. It was just a, almost like a natural response because of the way I grew up, because of the things that I had experienced. I felt that I would kind of like safeguard myself. So I was, at times I was really explicit with how I felt. And at others, it was vague and you knew that I was either angry, happy, but you couldn't really tell like where I was headed in some of them. And then some of them, they're just like crystal clear where I expose myself in a way that only emotions enable you to do so when you're just writing out of emotion. So yeah, I think sometimes I... The, um, before you came in, Adrian had mentioned that there was a really excellent educational program, and we, they, which is incredible, incredibly rare, um, to underscore that again. Did you find that writing was useful or helpful when you were in doing that that program? Could you describe what it is too, because I didn't yeah, say that'd be what good. the bar yeah. thing was. Okay, that was later on, and and also just lift it up, mic up just a tiny bit. You might be okay. just a little shy of it. Thanks. We got instructions backstage about how to do this. Well, I had some as well, so. Oh, good, oh, good, okay. I just got caught up in the dialogue. But um, later on in, later my incarceration, I, they brought Bar College back in. Okay, yeah. And not back in, but they brought it in for the first time. And through that program, I acquired an associate's degree and then a bachelor's degree from them. and. So that enhanced my ability to describe what I was feeling, also to talk about it comfortably. Prior to that, I also completed a one-year certificate program in human services and from the New York Theological Seminary. So that also gave me an ability to write a bit more clearly and explain what I was feeling a bit more clearly. But what that also did was make me aware of what I was feeling in a way that now it was a conscious, I can't expose this or I can't expose that or what would people, how would they feel or how would they view me if I expose these weaknesses? So 
And I think only maturity, maturity enables you to really go past that. No amount of education will ever help you get past that. So it was a growth process that really enabled me to go past that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something? Because he said something. I never actually asked you this. Now I'm curious about getting when you when you first went in, getting pens, paper, pencils, all of that. Was that ever a problem, or was that sort of generally easy to do? No, it's generally easy. They provide that. I mean, yeah. yeah. Before you came in, um, Piper had said that when she got to a women's facility, they she had none of those things in the first few days because you had to buy a pen, you had to buy whatever you needed, and that there was a sort of welcoming committee of other um, inmates who might say, do you need something? Did you have that experience that inmates would welcome you? I guess it's a question about yeah, gender. Generally, I mean, <laughs> I mean, they they... You do have people who have a natural affinity to say, what do you need? How can I help you? And then you have others who say, how can I help you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, it's a tricky situation. And that your first days of reception are what Piper was describing. You have nothing. So at, at that point, you do go through a few days where you really i just trying to wrap your mind around what they just did to you, mm. and which is that they strip you of everything you understood. They strip you of your name, your identity, um, any, any physical affiliation you had to any demographics, where you were located. I mean, they re completely remove you from the city, take you these, to these small towns, and they indoctrinate you with this new culture, prison culture, where you're no longer a person, you're a number. And there's just so many layers of how that happens that you're just trying to cope with that in, in those days. So, you know, you have people who really feel like, wow, let me reach out to this person because I'll have someone now to lean on and rely on. And then you have people who take advantage of that because they're accustomed to it. They understand it, you know, and they embrace it as part of their lives from that point forward. Mm -hmm. You are so vulnerable those first few days. And frankly, you're vulnerable even if you go from facility to facility. You're vulnerable as you enter, you know, so you leave. Like, I leave Danbury where I know the deal. I know everyone there. I've got my job. I've got my setup. And you go to another facility, and even if you've been doing time, you're still in a vulnerable position. And so maybe because it's a women's facility, you know, I felt I, I was, again, you know, that first day, I'd never been in prison before, I'd never been in jail before. Very vulnerable, and what was shocking to me was that people didn't take advantage of me. Though you're very watchful, I mean, you, it's not like you don't know that you're vulnerable, you're sort of sitting there just like, ah, I'm a sitting duck. Did you, in the, the three facilities you were in, I mean, I understand the one is, is probably more transient, mm -hmm. the, the FedEx facility, so to speak, but, mm -hmm. but did you see educational programming in the facilities oh. you were in? So uh, in Danbury, there's a GED program. It's kind of a disaster. There was a college class that was offered from a local community college. It was not accredited. So on, on the one hand, it was great because definitely folks, it was a basic business class. Okay. Folks could go through it, but that was it. So any additional education that you wanted to gain, you could, if you could pay for a correspondence class, you could do that. Why was the GED program a disaster? Because it was run by a guy who had basically like flunked out of the postal service, who you know hated his job and was quite vocal about that fact. You know, it was a mess. There had been, and it was incredibly variable because apparently there had been a previous staffer who had run it before, who was very much liked, and it had gone. But it's that um, there's a real sense of lack of supervision, <laughs> quite frankly, which is ironic in a minimum security setting. You have a low staff to prisoner ratio, you know, a minimum security women's prison camp is not full of, is not a, a very violent setting, so there's not a requirement for a lot of staff presence. Um, and that sort of carries through to the staff being almost sort of unsupervised. So like staff can sort of do what they want. If they're conscious of their jobs, they do them. And if they're not, there's not a lot of penalties for them. In Oklahoma City, you know, again, it's essentially almost like a holding cell. It's almost like a like limbo or a bus stop, which you, you know you've got bus stops 
Yeah, transit. Yeah. So, transit. but imagine like an entire, a, a whole facility is a bus stop. I'm sorry. A bus stop is where you get put when you first arrive in a facility setting before you get your permanent housing assignment, before you get assigned to your job, before you truly get inter integrated into the general population. And then the final setting was a federal jail. So a federal jail is where you get locked up if you have committed a crime and you can't make bail, or you're not given bail. Um, or a lot of uh, folks who are getting arrested now in immigration situations are being held sometimes in ICE facilities, but also in federal jails. Um, there are even fewer sort of privileges or rights afforded to prisoners in those settings than in a regular prison. So there, were no, there was no educational programming of any sort there that we participated in. That was another funny setting because that federal jail is like a 26-story high-rise in the middle of the Chicago Loop, and it houses approximately 700 prisoners. 35 of us were women on one floor, so the other factor there was this extreme lack of resources that were appropriate for us, female prisoners, right down to clothing. There, were, there was no female clothing, even underpants in that setting. <laughs> yeah, a lot of what we on the outside see about prison comes from television, comes from movies, comes from literature that we, we you know, and some of it's very good and very accurate and some of it's not so good. What, Anthony, what do you think, what do you, when you see what's represented to popular culture about the prison experience, what do you see as totally ridiculous or disparate? Disparity. Um, nothing and everything, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because there's, what I think they've done with the prison shows that they create now is they, they respond to the, to the moment, whatever's in fashion. And if you take Oz or you take any movie that they created, like American Me and all these other prison movies, you'll see a reality everything in there will correspond to something that's happening in prison at, at one part or one prison or another, but it's just not a general overall blanket statement that this is what it is. Because each individual experiences that differently. And as a person and as a, a subject in that element, you recreate that space or you just accept it. So you may have similarities, but nothing is truly accurate. It's almost like a distorted image that you look in the mirror and you see this big distortion, and that's what these movies are really, really are. Well, they're probably not as boring as doing time. <laughs> might be either, right? They, it's edited, right? It's I, edited. I know, do you have thoughts on that, what you saw? Um, I mean, I my big... Uh, beef with the depiction of prisoners is around violence and you know i don't know if you have comment on that i'll tell you in there's a lot of conflict in prison for sure prisons are incredibly crowded i mean you are jammed in there with tons of other people so even under <laughs> i'm sure if you all had to live in the kind of uh crowding situation that that happens you know, conflict naturally arises when there's too many people, too few resources, you know, and in some cases not enough to do with your time. Um, but straight up, you know, like the use of force on the part of prisoners especially is just not something that I witnessed. It's something I heard about sometimes, but it's not something that I witnessed. And so that's something that I, um, I think that one of the big excuses for keeping millions and millions of Americans incarcerated is the idea that prison, prisoners are uncontrollably and irredeemably violent. And that is the, the picture that, um, that many people have in their head, and, and I take issue with that. Um, I have an opposite perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Prisons are extremely violent. Mm -hmm. um, in one prison, that I was housed in Clinton Danamora, you actually had deaths, like multiple deaths every month. Like it, they wouldn't even shut down a prison unless someone died. So 
there's a culture of violence that exists and this is a, I think it plays a big role is when you're in a maximum security facility, you have people who have 40 to life, 50 to life, 80 to life, 20 to life. These people don't see any light at the end of the road. So you become part of this warped reality where it's a conflict. This is your space. You fight for space that is never yours. You, I mean, as soon as you and I get in a fight and we leave this facility, it's going to, someone else is going to claim it and they'll fight for it. And as I started getting closer and closer to the city and I started getting closer and closer to my release date, the entire atmosphere of the prison changed. I mean, and families coming in to visit even felt that change. So can you say what the change was? Just an, it's not a tangible change. It's not something you could put your finger on, but you understand it because it's almost like in these maximum security prisons, you feel the tension when you walk into that yard. You understand it like in a way that you can't really say, okay, look, the tension is right here. It just saturates the entire environment. When you get closer, you don't feel that anymore. So when you go to the yard, you still don't feel that friendly feeling but it's not a hostile environment. And I've never experienced in all the maximum security prisons that I've been to, I've never been to any where I didn't see at least one person slashed or stabbed every single day that I was there. Every single day. And I spent almost 17 years incarcerated. So prisons are very violent. I, I can say even in the visiting rooms, because I would visit you when you were moving around, and the difference in the visiting rooms was noticeable. I mean, the body language of people in the various visiting rooms, the um, way that the corrections officers treated those of us that were being processed. I mean, I remember Clinton very well. It was a really, um, it was a scary place. It, w it felt sort of like the, the Wild West in the old days, you just sort of had this feeling that I remember there was a corrections officer had, that had this tattoo of a, a like a black child on a hangman's noose, like rolled up just processing people. I mean, it just sort of felt surreal. I mean, parts of it. And But then when you were in um, Woodburn, the guards would say hello. I mean, at first I was so suspicious even when they would say hello, I would say hello. And I remember thinking, you know, what's this, I, I was so used to just being treated a certain way, so even as an outsider and with a very limited kind of access, and there could be anything, like if your vending machine, if you put money in, you get food from vending machines during the visits and the money was eaten by the machine. At a place like Clinton, you wouldn't even have thought to ask the officer to help you at all, even if that was the only money you had and you had four hours left or six hours left in children that needed food, but at Woodburn, you felt that you could at least say, I lost the money, could you help me? I'm, it wasn't like a fuzzy, warm place, but you felt there was some level of professionalism in that room at least. Um, that, that I tried to visit the, 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 the uh, prisoner I was talking about before, the man who's serving time in Florida, for, he's been in 32 years, and I tried to visit him, um, and there were two ways I could do the paperwork. I could do it as a friend or family, or I could do it as my official capacity at Penn, and I had to pick which one to do, and I knew which, you know, I, I picked the professional pen way, and then of course in the beginning, well, you didn't do the family way, and, and eventually I could not visit him, and I was driving south from New York, and you know, I was calling from Virginia and the Carolinas and Georgia as I was getting closer to Daytona, um, where he's doing time, and I, I, it, when you were saying that you can feel, I knew he had gotten a little bit of attention for his writing. It was on the website, and he had gotten a few things published. And I had this feeling, he's getting too much attention, and this is, this is, this, they don't like that, you know? And, and even though he's a model prisoner, he's a, and he's, you know, helped with educational programs, that sense of, I could sense it even on the outside, you know, so it doesn't surprise me what you're saying, but, um, and of course, eventually they did, you know, put him in solitary, and they've been, you know, quite, um, indifferent to him. In terms of sort of self-censoring or direct censorship from prison officials, I was really cautious about things like keeping a journal, for example. People often ask about, <clears throat> in terms of the book, 
you know, oh, did you keep a detailed journal? How did you, you know, how, which, what, what's going on with your attention to detail, et cetera? And I always viewed that as a potential risk because a journal would be a thing that you would have on you, that you would write, you know, whatever you're writing in about your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences, <clears throat> it would be sitting there in your locker, which could be shaken down at any time, and they can take anything they want. And so letters out seemed much less risky to me in terms of just expressing myself, um, separate from the risk of, of exposure to whoever I was writing the letter to. That's a different question, or it's a different story. But um, I felt like there was such a volume of mail coming in and going out of that facility that the, unlike your, the person you're mentioning who clearly was singled out and, pay, and paid attention to. Well, then to, obviously not everyone's flunking out of the postal system because letters are getting through. <laughs> they are getting through. <laughs> and they're all opened and it's understood that anything, you know, in theory they're all being read, though you know that in practice they're not. Um, so that seemed much less risky, and in Wait, fact... Wait, say that again. In theory, they're getting read. In theory, mean, every letter is being opened and read oh, you mean for <clears> censorship by prison purposes. officials, mm -hmm. but in practice, there's simply too large a volume of mail mm -hmm. for them to ever... I don't know if you disagree with that, but, you know, there's no way they were reading all that mail. So it's felt, that felt much less so risky. So it's random, it, what, what gets it's through random is random. It's random or by targeting. I mean, obviously, the person you're describing is being targeted. Well, he, he certainly thinks so, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds mm -hmm. like he is. Did you see people <laughs> in prison who couldn't read or write? Yeah. yeah. Any idea, like how many? A lot. A lot. I, I can't put a percentage on it because you, some people you will never know until you lived with them mm -hmm. in the same dorm or cell block because they're brilliant in everything but academia. Mm -hmm. So you really wouldn't be able to gauge that until you lived with them and they develop trust with you and they say, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to read my letters for me and respond for me. And, and that takes a level of confidence that not everybody develops mm -hmm. with a person in there. So, but there's a high illiteracy rate in prison. Mm -hmm. Were your own skills pretty good? Like writing, reading, writing when you yeah, went in? Yeah, going in, um, unfortunately I, I spent like a the majority of my life in prison. So I, I acquired my GED when I was 17 mm -hmm. while in a juvenile detention center. And I've always been smart. You know, I always can think a little bit. So I, I didn't have that problem, but I've met a lot of people who have. And that has been a hindrance for them only because we put so much value in stock and education. But if you gauge them on their brilliance alone, I mean, you, you meet some really phenomenal people who can't read and write, but are just brilliant. One of the things about educational programming um, that I'm sure everybody in this room probably has an idea of is that it's known to lower recidivism when there are good educational programs, and not just by you know 2% or something, like by large double-digit percentages. Do, do, you, do you feel like that's true from being on the inside and seeing that? Yes. What, when we walk back into society, when you're incarcerated and you're coming back into society and you come into society with nothing to offer, you don't have a resume, you don't have any credentials, you don't have anything to support your brilliance. You already have a mark against you because you're a felon and then you don't have any credentials to present to give them an op to, for them to give you an opportunity to show what you have to offer. And what it, what it creates is we create a large population of prisoners who we're setting up to come back to prison. We're not preparing them enough or giving them enough to release them back into a society where they can compete for employment, where they can contribute to their society, where there can be a resource to their family. Instead, you have many men and women coming home who don't have an education, who don't have those credentials, and are released into a family setting where there's still a liability to their family, where they still feel like I'm still leeching off of my family, even in the streets. What are my options? And unfortunately, the streets are an option that really gives them a temporary solution to a larger and deeper problem. 
Did you find, this is a question that's very interesting to me personally, but did you find that there was resentment towards you from any of the staff or, or the correctional officers because you were working um, with the BARD program or because you were um, getting an education? Yes. Um, the main, their main contention has always been why should you receive a free education and I have to pay for my child's? And a barred representative in one of our graduation ceremonies brought that up. So she said, you know, so many people respond this way and they say, why is he getting an education for free and I have to pay for my child? And she responded, well, have your child switch places with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, I mean, the cost for that education goes way deeper than any monetary number. Any significant amount of money you can put on the table, and I would say, okay, you can, you can have all that, and just let me go free. And there's, you sacrifice a part of your, this is my general sense of it, and it's my personal experience of it, is that you sacrifice a part of your humanity to survive in prison. You have to shut down elements of who you are as a human being, natural things that we take for granted, like expressing clear emotions to say, wow, that's beautiful, that's nice, well, I really love you, I like spending time with you. You have to sacrifice certain parts of your humanity in order to survive in prison with your sanity. Will I ever be able to reclaim that? I doubt it, but I recognize it and move forward with it. Some people can't. So the cost of that education is extremely high for us. Mm -hmm. Piper, what about, you're a Smith graduate. Did that get known in the culture? Did you get, were you ridiculed for that or, or resented for that? Not, um, not in any obvious way. You mean by staff or by other prisoners? Both. I, it doesn't matter. More, more, more. My question is more about staff, but I'm interested mm -hmm. in the whole. Um, there's certainly some staff who didn't like me, um, but you know, I, I sort of made a a practice right from the jump of trying to minimize as my contact with staff as much as possible, because um, there's nothing good that comes out of a lot of contact with staff. Yeah. Um, really. Yeah. The, I mean, there's nothing good in terms of, I mean, you might be perceived by other prisoners in a certain way if you're kind of cozy with the staff in the first place, which you don't really want. But also you are, I mean, especially in a women's prison where most of the staff are men, you are, um, you would be vulnerable to uh, abuse and exploitation. So among other prisoners though, I, the simple answer is no. I was far from the only middle class woman in that facility. I'm, I'm talking about Danbury primarily because that's where I spent most of my time. There were other middle class women and other college educated women there as well. So it's not as though I was the only person. Um, <clears throat> what I found was definitely that you sort of become known for whatever your skill or talent is in prison and people have incredible varieties of skills and talents which, which some of which flourish because um, because the setting demands that you be extremely creative and um, clever about trying to carve out your humanity um, or protect your humanity. And so people understood that, you know, reading and writing was one of my strengths. And so for sure, people would come to me and say, can you write a letter for me? People would ask me to do things like write a motion for them, which I was really uncomfortable doing, but I would do something like write a letter to their judge, you know, fr from them, um, but help them with that kind of stuff, help them with furlough requests, you know, those sorts of things. Um, so uh, other prisoners were, I think, generally, and you know, I don't know, there's probably some significant differences between men and women in the way they um, form these communities. You know, it's well, one of the ironic. reasons I asked that question about about staff is uh -huh. because I mean it's been explained to me by any number of individuals that one of the reasons Pell grants were voted, you know, out in the early '90s was because of the tremendous resentment 
among the staff of prisons because they themselves didn't have access to that education that prisoners were getting. So while at the same time it was helping the prisoner not to repeat right. and like you have some, some ability to reintegrate into society, it was being taken away. So that loop of guaranteeing they would have no skill, no ability where they'd go back in. Um, but, and, and, and it's not like the money, although the argument was presented that this money was being taken from other students on the outside, it wasn't like Pell Grant money went up to other students, it just disappeared. And it was such a minuscule amount of money that went into prison, so the whole thing is really mind boggling. But my, what, hang on one second, <laughs> I just wanna say this is we on the prison committee have talked about this among ourselves, some of us, and we have this idea that you know, it's kind of like walking down the street, stuff pops into your head, but we would like to see a country where maybe there's like a GI Bill for people who work in prisons. And that, you know, they're under the same deforming pressures. You know, they have to go to work every day at this facility. A lot of them, that's the only job they can get for whatever reason due to, you know, geography or, or, or school abilities themselves. And so if they themselves could access some kind of education in the way that somebody else is serving their country would that that might um, alleviate some of that i don't know it's a pipe dream it's never going to happen but i just put it out there because you reinforced again that jealousy and that envy and i think it's a really debilitating thing sorry to interrupt you well the thing i'll say about that point is just that i think that CO, being a co is a terrible job Absolutely. terrible job and you know and i mean CO I correction officer correctional like, yeah. officer being a prison guard is a terrible job and so I did short time, I did 13 months, and they were doing 20 years, you know? They were all, they talked about their pensions all the time, like how am I gonna get to 20 years? How can I stand this for 20 years? Of course they had the option to leave every day, they were there by choice, not by um, restraint. But you know, it is a terrible job, um, crappy job. And the thing that I would say about educational programs that I, I think that folks should think about is that the cost of providing educational programs to prisoners is relatively low. But when we think about like what we spend, so we spend more than $60 billion on prisons in this country, probably closer to 70 billion. And that money doesn't just disappear into the ether, a huge percent of, percentage of it falls to the bottom line of private companies. And some of those are straight up private prisons like the Correctional Corporation of America which you know, posted record profits during the worst economic situation in my lifetime and any of our lifetimes. And some of it goes to you know, the many vendors who work with, directly with government-run facilities, though there are more and more private prisons in this country. So and They have trade shows, they have right. advertising. So there's no incentive there in that situation to have fewer prisoners. <laughs> no, you and know. when prison beds go empty, you know, the, the profits suffer, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, Adrian, in your writing, um, Random Family, did you feel like you came to have points of view on these issues of education, recidivism? We want solutions. <laughs> well, I think in Piper's book also captures this. I, um, I have to say, I think it took a long time for me to even have a thought, really, from my early like at first it was just sort of all overwhelming and interesting and weird, you know what I mean? It was going into an alternate universe. In some ways my senses were completely engaged. It was, I was trying to understand things, I was trying to get information. So there's a long period of time where I, I can't really say I was sort of processing anything. I just, I guess what I'm, I'm left with um, when I hear, you know, these numbers that will have always existed about the profits and the beds and, you know, when you, see the towns where these facilities are and what's going on with the families in those towns, um, the sort of impact of that kind of job, for example, on an actual family, what all kinds of things that go on, the suicide rates of COs and the alcoholism rates. And I mean, everybody's poisoned by this approach. Um, I just have a lot of anger. And I, as a journalist, I have a lot of worry about um, the near abandonment of the fight for access 
to these public institutions. I mean, I sort of, as a journalist, I say these are prisons that our tax dollars pay for and citizens go to them and we should have an absolute right to know what's going on in them in the same way that you can find out what's going on in a public school or, you know. You could make a citizen's visit. And well, you say, should be able you know, to. I mean, I want to see it, you know. And historically, when there were rehabilitative phases in corrections I, ideas, um, those were, there was some, Access. So I worry a great deal about the access, and, and you know, I once did a story at a, the biggest women's facility in California, which had 4,000 women, and I, it was on assignment with the New York Times, and only for that reason was I able to get any access, and it was a guided tour after, I think, two months. Uh, not two months. I, I went out to the facility. I was supposed to get in, as often happens in prisons, you can have, be on a visiting list, you can have the clearance, you can have the paperwork and your ID, and there's always something that you might not have or some kind of glitch, and you, it just sort of doesn't matter if you've driven to Indiana for a visit to see somebody, if you have the slightest problem or you can't find your, you know, your names on a list. So I was sort of out in California, and the Times had the money and the backing to let me wait it out. This is not, this doesn't exist. I'm not sure they could do it again, and I got the most controlled of visits meaning walked around sort of the certain public spaces in this enormous facility that was in the biggest in the world, right? Um, and I was unable for a, a newspaper to sort of get a lot of basic information. And every woman that I spoke to, I put at risk. You know what I mean? In the yard, I remember it, all these women wanting to talk, coming up, and then a CO would say, you sure you want to talk to her? You sign this form, because they had a stack of release forms. And I could see those women, you know, and a couple of them were brave enough to take the form and sign it, but you know what I'm saying? So the, just getting basic information, I wasn't doing some kind of expose. I was just trying to write about this huge facility where if I was a vendor or a, a foreign visitor who was thinking of having some kind of a new prison in my country, I could have gotten an incredible tour, but not as an American citizen. So I have a, a lot of professional worry, a lot of frustration. I think the connection between poverty and the racism and the lack of education and the funneling in of um, basically kids, you know, you, the tracking that basically leads to prison, the information is in. It's been in for a really long time. I mean, now people are coming out, you know, like you're saying, you come out without a, skills, you've been locked up for 15, 20 years. I mean, it's a no brainer, really, and all the priorities are really off base. So I guess I just have a lot of anger and worry and, um, the last thing I guess I'll say is I was also just overwhelmed over time by the enormous sadness that I felt. Um, the visits drained me in a way. At the beginning, I was sort of energized and trying to, you know, um, absorb things. But over time, I knew a lot of family members that sort of dreaded going to see their loved ones. And I was so confused by this because I knew they loved them, but I couldn't really understand. I think, well, wouldn't you really want to go? But it's so emotionally draining to see people that you care about in this situation. And as we became closer over time, plus my being seasoned, it was harder and harder to get in there because it was airless. It was sort of, you know, um, it was a very sad place prison. I, you know, I, I found women's prisons have a very different vibe, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, depression um, or there's, you know, a lot of sexual frustration and tension. I think there's a lot of anger. There's all, it's a place of enormous suffering that guards and inmates experience um, and as visitors. So I found myself so, I, I was so eager, you know, when you got out, I was like, oh, I'm so glad, you know, he'll be out. I won't have to go visit anymore. But the reality is I know people through you that are still incarcerated. I know other people. And now I just always know they're there. Like I can identify the sign to a prison. You won't even notice them unless you have loved one there. I know where they are. It's, they're always there. There are just people there. There are people that have no business being detained. Um, the impact on you, you know, your children, on children. And, those, and these were the people that got visits. I mean, when we would visit, it was often the same guys, right? It was always the same guys, same family. So there were hundreds of guys in these facilities. I saw this, that's how I got to know a lot of the people because we would always be the same people visiting. So all those kids You that, see them you know, too, like in our city, if you're on 59th Street at Columbus Circle yeah. at a certain time, you see the people waiting in line for the buses that go upstate and they're the same people. Uh, every, uh, you know, the same group travels together on the bus, they get to know each right. other. And they know that if you have contact with your family over the course of your 
incarceration that your chances, your, it lowers your recidivism rate if you have connection. And it's very difficult to sustain that when everything costs money. When Did you, you have trouble getting phone calls? Periodically, yes, mm -hmm. because they were so high at one point that it was impossible. It was really basically for my family to say, do I accept his phone calls or do I ensure that or do I ensure that we still have food in the refrigerator? How much would a phone call cost? Up to, I think it was like nine, ten dollars for one phone call at one the time. The first minute could be like four. four. That's why you called me, though. I was lucky. That's why you call me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> nobody else would take are so call. expensive because, um, because telecom companies have monopolistic contracts with prisons. And so it's literally a captive audience. And it's... There's it's a, unbelievable. <laughs> there, it, there's a there was a big class action suit finally because that was the biggest cost of doing my book with the phone calls. Then I became sort of a message center because people would call <laughs> and they would say, "Could you tell my mother this or that?" But a regular phone call was anywhere from like ten to twelve bucks. They 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 changed it now. It, it went down a lot. They they won the the suit. The suit How much is uh, it now? Uh, about three dollars and change. So I mean, it went down significantly. Where's Skype? But it was, uh, yeah, like, I mean, why? still, there's so much coverage of cell phones in prisons as, you know, nefarious, you know, ways to do business, which may certainly be true, but the other reality is that if you think about your own cell phone service and what that costs you, it's pennies per call, as opposed to, you know, the yeah, poorest families. We're talking about, you know, the people who I served my time in prison. There were middle class well, women there. Well, and a breadwinner is out of the house, uh, male, female, whatever. It's some, somebody's absent who is also, for if there are children in the household particularly, which there usually or frequently are, Absolutely. That, that a person who can provide for a child is absent in any capacity of earning as well. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Gets me mad. But. but, you know, I think the other thing that, um, you know, prisons are incredibly sad sad places you're absolutely right and they're sad because not only because of personal failures which are certainly something that i think every person who's locked up thinks about but it's a massive s social failure you know and that extends to the people who work there that ex when you're looking at a two-thirds fail like a tolerance of a two-thirds failure rate for a massive government system is sort of incredible and the vast majority of the people who find themselves in prison are there because of the failure of some other social system, be it the educational system, be it the, uh, the healthcare system, because mental illness and prisons go hand in hand to a shocking and terrifying degree. Like, absolutely, the, when people ask me about being frightened in prison, the people who, you, who I was most cautious with or that you sort of would give the widest berth were people who are very obviously mentally ill. Um, and so those are failures that happen that, that come home to roost in the prison system. That's where you see uh, those things sort of come to land. And it's very heartbreaking. I'd like to, um, oh, hang on one second. I just want to say we're going to turn up the lights in a moment and ask if you have questions. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to just finish out the thoughts if anybody had something they needed yeah, to say. I, the other issue, I guess, also just personally for people that I know that are in prison or have been, but also just as a journalist, I care deeply about is the issue of health care, which I saw most acutely in um, my exposure to women's prisons for some reason it was i think it was mainly because um, it was the issues around uh, medication and uh childbearing you know and pregnancy were very prime sexual abuse and people getting pregnant and all this was happening and because the health care like to me one of the things that was so terrifying is the powerlessness you know if you are unwell in prison or you get physically hurt or you become sick it's atrocious, you know, the quality of um, health care. Well, and the food is really bad, too, so your health your is Your whole, down. yeah, ability to get well in any sort of way, I think, is really like a major act. You have to really devote a portion of your time, right? I mean, the food alone is a big issue. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about breakfast being the only edible meal because oh, it yeah, was cereal. Oh, yeah, especially in Oklahoma City. Like literally just saving that bag of milk all day because you knew it was the only sort of thing that you'd have all day that would be completely reliable as being edible and nutritious. Hmm. Let's. Do people have questions. 
Anyone? I'm having trouble. Over here? Oh, yeah, and also there's a microphone on the right and left-hand side of the stage if you'd feel comfortable to come up and use the microphone to ask your question. No questions? Yes, would you step up to the mic? Great, thank you. Why don't you line up? You know, you had a question also, and then we can be all set. Anthony, I must say I'm interested in your experiences, and I'm wondering uh, just personal issues like how long you've been out and what you're doing now. Um, I've been out for 13 months now. Um, I work for a very uh, supportive company. And the challenges that I faced coming home were that even though I had a lot of credentials and a lot of support, I went into these interviews and for several companies that are really supposedly proactive and really liberal companies. And when the family question came up, the entire interview changed at an in instantaneously. It was like, okay, you're qualified. I see your resume, you, you fabulous. You present yourself well, this, that. And then the, I see here you were convicted of a felony. How long ago was that? And then I'll tell them. Then they'll say, okay, so how long have you been home? A month. The entire, I mean, it just, it was heart wrenching. and. The interview before the last interview where I work now, I finally sat there and I already, like I understood the dynamic. It was clear and it was consistent. Every person, it was almost as they rehearsed these different companies on how to respond to a person who was convicted of a felony. So the last um, person I spoke with, I told him, you know, I would like to meet a person and a company who's courageous enough to allow me the opportunity to become an asset to your company. I guarantee you that if you give me that opportunity, I will be an asset to your company. And he looked at me and kind of like, yeah, we heard that all before. And so I interviewed for this company. They gave me an opportunity and then there's, it's just amazing what I've done in the time that I've been there. I've worked there since August. I don't want to mention the name because I don't really want to publicize it, but they've been extremely supportive. They've created a foundation for me and other people like me and really are giving people an opportunity. And they have really, we have changed the face of the ex-felon for these people. I got to brag, and he's been promoted like, I don't know, <laughs> three times. Oh, <laughs> Did you ask your question? Um, well, you know, I mean, obviously, I don't have to tell any of you that I think our society really loves to take prisons and prisoners and sort of put them off in a dark corner. And, you know, as you, Piper, mentioned, have this sort of idea that prisoners are inherently dangerous and uncontrollable and that as long as they're not on the street that it doesn't really matter where they are they're off somewhere else and it's just kind of amazing that uh, how little awareness we have of how little rehabilitation is actually going on and that we do have this huge failure rate in a government program that we are paying for um i i guess my question is sort of both where do you think some of that comes from? You know, I, I, that you mentioned that um, this one writer is sort of being singled out for trying to publicize the things that have happened to him. And is that coming from the top down of the prison system? Is that just we don't have an interest in it because it's unpleasant? And It's really what, hard to see, I think, too. Yeah. Well, and, and what are the ways that we can change that? You know, is, is sort of personal narrative the way to go? Is it better journalistic access? As you said, we're paying for this. We should be able to walk into a prison. Um, you know, sort of how, how can we combat that, that issue? What, can I just, so one thing that I think is, is that if you can't cover prisons in terms of sort of the kind of writing I do, which is more along feature type stories, it should absolutely be covered as a business story. I mean, no doubt. The amounts of money, it should be part of a the, you know, it should be covered in all the ways it is, a regional stories, 
uh, business stories, stories about psychology, public health, all of that. What I would point out is that if you have some religious affiliation, however, you mm -hmm. can get into yeah. prisons. Like if you go in with your various religious um, faith or whatever, church people get into prisons and they're in prisons and they're, they have access to prisons. And I find that um, it's worthy of note. Um, and uh, a contradiction why, you know. We mean more religious journalists, is that what you're saying? <laughs> Maybe more undercover journalists <laughs> posing as religious missionaries, no, I don't know. Point well taken, point well taken. You know, that's it's interesting that that's allowable, um, but yet if, a, if you as a citizen of the city wanted to go to the woman's prison that's overlooking Chelsea Piers and say, I'd like to sort of sit and talk with someone who doesn't get any visitors, or is there some way that I can see what's going on? Um, you know, short of trying to get in access to a psychiatric unit, it's pretty, I think partly because the stories also are on the backs of the people that are actually in the prison when it shouldn't necessarily be seen only as a story about inmates. It's a story about uh, large systems and inmates are a part of that, but they're not the only story. But education would allow them to tell more of their own stories, obviously. Another question? Somebody else had their hand up over there before. Over Oh, sir. Hi. Yeah. Hi. I'm Jessica Siegel. I actually teach journalism at NYU. This has been an amazing, amazing panel. One of my students this semester did try to really very, very hard to do a story about abuse of juveniles, the sexual abuse of juveniles. There's, there's the new study that came out. And he really had great difficulty making contact through organizations. I think if he'd had some more time, he might have been able to really do it. So my, my question is, is how can journalists cover the story better? And also, student journalists in college, they're very enthusiastic. They have not lost the sense of wanting to do good. We want to encourage them to do that. Um, there's a lot of celebrity culture taking over. It's very seductive. These stories are harder to do. They take more time. They take more labor. So what's your advice um, for what I can do as a professor and what I'm sure there's journalists in the room, what everyone can do to get in there? Well, I, I mean, do you want to, did you have, no, I, I, well, I would say a bunch of things. I, I would say go to all of those places where prison sort of touches down, meaning families, you know, uh, the, the kind of facility, the places where when people, when people are going in and out of prisons or they're in prison, wh where are they, like, wh where, where are there signs of this, right, whether it's the bus companies that, bring people to visitation, whether it's the people that sell food and vending machines, whether it's the families of incarcerated people, whether it's the hospitals that serve, for example, Danbury, um, you know, when a woman gives birth in prison, where are they going? Who are the physicians that treat those women? I mean, you have to nose around a lot and spend a lot of time and you eventually will meet the nurse that sort of feels a certain way to have women shackled while they're actually giving birth, which is a common practice in the American prison system that you're actually shackled while you're giving birth. And um, so I would say to figure out or talk to people like me or people that work um, to do uh, uh, work on prison rights cases or class action suits, uh, as is often the case with underreported stories, the people who are doing good work in these fields are totally overworked, they're totally overtired. The lawyers that are fighting these cases on sexual abuse, for example, of women in prison, you know, they don't even sleep, let alone see their own children. So it's hard as a journalist to get in there, but um, I would say volunteer. Go find a religion and get in there. Start talking to people. If you have one, you probably have one. I'm sure there are journalists that do. I don't know. Get in there. D go in. Um, try to do projects. Um, students sometimes have extra leeway because they're students. And um, But the last thing I would say is the other piece that was striking to me, um, and you also know as a writer on prison, I went to law school for a year on a fellowship to study these sentencing guidelines that were so stunning to me. I couldn't believe the sentences people were getting. I thought, I have to understand how this happened. And so I went to law school, and it was an elite law school, and criminal um, law was considered like loser, a loser field. It was definitely like the low law practice. It was not seen as, I mean, at loser law. It was just considered not not the kind of law you would practice if you wanted to um, be a top-notch lawyer, you know? And I thought that was, I was floored by that. I couldn't imagine a more kind of important 
field to get in in the law where the human beings were, you know, where the actual people were as opposed to the paper. And, um, but that also, I think there might be stories in that to figure out what's going on there and why that's the case. And certainly corrections officers, their kids, their kids have a lot of problems. I've always wanted to do a story, maybe one of your students could, on the impact of what it means when your parent, parents work, because often the, the whole family will work in corrections and the impact on kids is pretty weird. And they do all these, a lot of these officers live in, group, in gated communities, like in California, they all live together, um, they play together. Um, they do things and just find out what they do and go play laser tag, whatever, paintball. I, I, I would just <laughs> emphasize how, I mean, to, to get a sense of just how difficult it is for journalists to gain access to prisons, um, if anyone has read Ted Conover's wonderful book, which is called New Jack, Ted Conover wanted to, was a journalist, and he wanted to write about prisons. He was interested in it, and he could simply not gain access. So he went to the Correctional Officers Academy, and he became a prison guard, and he worked in Sing Sing for a year. And it's a great book, um, but that's just how hard they make it. And it's a public, you're absolutely right, it's a public system. Your tax dollars are paying for it, so. The man I was talking about in Florida to Charlie Norman, when he joined this uh, diary project, there was a reporter in Florida, in Miami, who, was, who I got to know, and she was interested in doing a story. And she visited him, and they gained access to her, and she came in with video equipment, and they videotaped it, and so forth. And um, then they didn't like some of the things he wrote. And that was part of the problem. You know, they had put this really good face on, oh, see, anybody can come access him as long as he would be doing what they wanted him to do in his journal and personal writing. And when, and then that's my visit came after that visit, the one I was trying to make. And I think already there was a pressure mounting on, hey, this guy, you know, um, he has a very interesting website, Free Charlie. Um, I recommend it. You can get it on the Penn website. I think we have a link to it as well, or we, you, you can write us at Penn and we can send you the link to it. Yes. That's why you get the most information from the younger generation who talk to rebel against their parents and the older, the older generation who've retired and accepted that, wow. You know, and a lot of them have looked back on their lives and said, I failed. And I met a few officers that were really human beings at the last facility I was housed in. I stood there for nine years. So I developed a, a, a relationship with them, not in a sense where we conversed with one another, but we acknowledged that it was his job and it was just, I was obligated to be there. And I just recently went back to bring my son to visit one of my friends and I went into the lobby area because I can't go in to visit. And then I seen the same group of officers who always try to bother guys, who try to, you know, really agitate the environment. And then I seen a couple of the good ones who were genuinely happy to see me and say, wow, we hear you doing really well. And, and I said, yes. And it just, was, it just felt really good when I turned to one of them and said, how are you doing? And he was like, oh, I'm all right. And I said, well, just let me know if you need me to pay for your truck. And like the guys that I really, you know, they felt it, you know, like they were like, yeah, won't you ask them for a loan? And so it was like a joke and they were with it. But they're the guys who, who would really explain to you some of the challenges that they faced. Because to be a prison officer, a successful prison officer, by their standards is to be able to oppress and sustain that oppression over a large body of people over a long period of time. So when you relinquish that pressure or you relinquish that power, then you failed as a correction officer. So, you know, I believe in inherently human beings are good people and that comes out at the end for not a large majority, but for a significant amount of correction officers. You have a question, yeah. Hi, I'm here with a, a writing group I have in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and hey. the, the benefits are, are many for all of us. I wonder, I have two questions if I may. One, um, Anthony, you mentioned earlier that writing uh, 
helped you become more aware, I think is what you said. And I wonder for each of you what writing w does for you uh, personally. And the second um, question is, were you given the power to dismantle the entire prison system? What would you put in its place? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Man, if I had a, like a good answer to that, I'd be rich tomorrow. Um, I think the only way that we can honestly dismantle the prison system is when we start to care about the people that, were, that are housed in it, but most importantly, the people who are going to be housed in it in the future. So put in a main focus in our communities, put in a main focus on the challenges that we're facing now would help us dismantle these prison systems and never have to create something in its stead. I'd rather see schools being built than prisons being built. But I'm also not the naive extremist that says everybody in prison is good because I know that that's not true. But I'm also not going to go to the extreme and say everybody in prison doesn't have the ability to be anything they want to be. All they need is the support and the opportunity. And we actually do recreate our space. And some prisoners have made that environment a tangible environment that they touch every day and they grow from and they learn. These are educational environments. And it's not the system that's working in their favor or enabling them to become who they are. It's just them taking control of that environment and recreating space and reinterpreting time in a way that they're saying, I'm not going to let this environment control me. I am going to control the environment. So although it's limited, it's powerful. Because if you have the power to do that under those circumstances, under that type of oppression, I think that you can be successful in any environment you're ever placed in ever again. Anthony, you talked about um, maturity. Yes. And you said that that was a turning point for you when you sort of felt yourself maturing. Why did you mature and doesn't somebody else? Or what does maturity mean to you when you, when you came to that? Maturity for me was my ability to understand that no matter how much experience I had, I still didn't know enough. It was my ability to say and really feel in my heart that I can't save the world I can't save my family. I can't convince anyone to be what I want them to be. I have to allow them and accept them as they are. I have to be able to love someone because I assign that, not because of what they do for me, but because what I feel inside. And I have to trust people because that is something that I'm giving without any expectation. So although all this was difficult for me, it was part of my maturity. It was, it was almost my acknowledging that, let me take this vanity, this real arrogance, and take that off as a blindfold and look at life for what it is. And sometimes we're scared to look in the mirror. But when you acknowledge the person in the mirror, it gives you an opportunity to really work on that person. So I don't know why others don't mature in a way that I have. And maybe they have. Maybe they've matured and excelled more than I have in their own capacity. So I think that it's highly individualistic and objective in a way, but also almost 100% subjective. So it's, it's just really yeah. deals with each individual and how they view life. What writing meant to you? Oh, what writing, OK. <clears throat> Um, writing, the reason why writing enables me to see things more clearly is because you have to think before you put the words on a page. Whereas if you're just talking to someone, you, you're really speaking without thinking and it's just an emotion. And writing really forces you to think about what you're saying. And then it gives you an ability to read it before you actually express it to anyone. And it just gives you a, almost like an extra step to gain clarity and not be as ambiguous if 
you just said it. So that's what. I mean, I think the incredible value of writing, especially either in a setting like prison or after prison, is that writing helps us make sense of our own lives. And that might be really banal or obvious thing to say, but that's the incredible value, whether you plan to ever share your writing with another person or not. You know, the act of writing helps you gain so much clarity about what you did, what you witnessed, what you felt. Um, and in the context of prison, which is a setting of incredible sadness, incredible um, conflict, sometimes violence, um, just an incredibly difficult, hard experience, it's really important to be able to take stock of that experience and to try to make some sense of it, especially when you do, you know, when you're either confronting the mistakes you made that landed you there, or if you're confronting the fact that there are these systems or even individuals who are so intent on get putting, on, on pushing you down. Um, and that's how I think of the prison system in a lot of senses is this, this funnel, which is just pushing millions and millions of people deeper and deeper into this funnel. That's the terrible thing about the system. So if you've been subject to that, if you've been part of that, the ability to try to make sense of that is incredibly valuable. And that's why sort of sitting down and putting pen to paper, again, it, you're right. When you write, a, it, it forces you to make it intelligible, both for yourself and for whoever you're trying to convey um, your message to you know, wh whoever your audience is. Another question? We have what time for one more. Okay. Um, quickly. Um, I was just wondering what insight you can give or to what extent the, the situation with the prison system today is a larger reflection of um, our society as a whole and how your each individual experience can, what's most important to you to convey or, or to speak to that? Well, there's a couple, there's two, th there's two things I would say about that. On a sort of philosophical level, you know, but not it, joking aside, you know, uh, in the course of working on the book and thinking about my own actions and thinking about the things that I experienced and the things I witnessed, you know, the, the very grain, the very core of crime is an indifference to the suffering of another person, whether you're stealing from them, whether you're hurting them physically, whether you're selling them a product you know is bad, you know, will hurt them. There's an indifference to the fact of that other person, what that other person will go through. And that's what allows you to do what you do. Um, and then you find yourself in prison and you're subject to that indifference on an incredibly crushing level. Um, that dehumanization, like that, that system that is designed for cruelty. And so I think that's the incredible failure and error. And that really, I mean, that comes from that, uh, that biblical concept of an eye for an eye. But I think that violence begets violence, and I think that suffering breeds more suffering. And um, I think that if we were able to to take stock of that and really think about what brings somebody who commits a crime to really confront the harm that they may have, that they've done, that's an ultimately much more fruitful approach. So aside from that sort of philosophical thought about restorative justice, you also cannot ignore the unbelievable racism of the criminal justice system in this country <laughs> and just the level of systemic targeting of poor communities, especially poor communities of color. So until we really sort of confront that, that's, you know, that's where we'll see change. I think that's where we'll have to stop. Um, please um, help me thank our panelists. <laughs>